cultural landmarks in the city. So that's one thing. And then hospitality, you have uh, hospitality on site. You're really like a basketball fan. You want to watch the whole tournament. You want to sleep close to the tournament. But you also have uh, packages that are more upscale, um, and you can get thousands of dollars. Opening ceremony, $2,500. Uh, average like uh, hospitality package, $3,800. They make sure that everybody can access the show. I think the cheapest tickets are 24 uh, euros. The third big piece to me, and that's the most important in all events, um, there are still measures in Beijing today that were put in place in 2008 for the Olympics. So when you look at the impact, it depends who you are, the stakeholders, right? Depends where you live, depends if you're a business person, uh, you have kids, uh, you, you know, it's who you are. So if you ask people what is the impact, the impact is going to be positive or negative depending on who you are, right? So, but. Generally, yeah, we have mixed feelings about those big games because they, 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 they can change um, urbanism development. Um, and that's what we talk about. We talk about mega event transport legacy. That's usually, in the case of the Olympic Games, the biggest change that people can experience. If they stay where they uh, were living when it was built, because what happens that you have gentrification and then new people come in and the ones that were there when, you know, they don't get to enjoy the improvement because the rent went, you know, it's real estate. Uh, so, um, uh, and so here you have really four things that we notice that we, you, you review past games. It's really building the infrastructure, bus lines, airports, um, everything that's happening at LAX, interesting, the Inglewood the transit connector, how you connect the big, uh, those big infrastructure to the city. Then you have service, you need service. Uh, you need to create routes, stations, and, and you can also zoom in in those stations. Uh, Bunker Hills is, is an example. Uh, it's been renovated, it's new, but you need people to come and, and, and spend time. It, it's, uh, so that's one thing, monitoring and also model shift. It's a behavior issue that you're trying to also, uh, you know, play with the demand and the offer. You're also trying to encourage people to forget about the car and you want to uh, encourage them to take other means of transport that are more sustainable in the wrong way. The other I want to stop you there, okay. actually, because that's your, your just the whole town. <laughs> um, but I want to stop you specifically because you talked about the legacy of people who are um, who are impacted after the games are over, after these major sporting events are over. And we, we can we'll talk in a little bit more about uh, individuals and workforce development and stuff like that. But I want to first start with the business community because those people will be here presumably after uh, World Cup, after Olympics, and so on. And so you know, my next question is about. What's the impact to business and how do we get them ready? So Layla, if you could talk a little bit more about the, you know, some of the efforts that the city has undertaken to try to get businesses ready for really what is gonna be peak sports economy for the next six years at a minimum. Yeah, we kind of see LA 28, you know, the 26 World Cup as like almost like carrot on a stick, right? How do we get people to, how do we use these events to propel an opportunity for our businesses? So what we have done through that, uh, we are, we're looking to, at two different tracks. One of them is just really procurement. How do we get contracts for small businesses? And one of the things that we're doing, one of them that I'd like to share today is just, uh, we're working with different partners uh, to create the, um, we're gonna be, yearly we're gonna have an event called the uh, Sports and Entertainment uh, Supplier Diversity Forum. And through this event every year, what we're trying to do is, because we understand as a city that the contracts are not gonna come from the city. They're gonna come from the venues and all these different events that are happening. So what we're trying to do is connect businesses to these venues, connect to people that are actually giving the contracts. And, and once they, they are making the connections, they, they can learn how to now uh, grow into a, becoming a contractor for, for uh, in leading up to LA 28. So it's a process. We know it's not gonna be done overnight. Um, in addition to that, we're also launching a campaign called Contract Ready LA. And that, con that initiative is really about teaching businesses how to contract, you know, understanding, because a lot of businesses have the capacity, they just don't know how to. And the third thing that we're doing in procurement, we're also doing a launching a contract financing fund, giving businesses um, enough funding, to get financing, so then you can contract with the city or, or get other contracts, so, so that there, you know, you can fill the gap, right? You don't have to wait for the money and, and have enough uh, money to, to operate your business. But on the other side, we're also looking at how do we activate our neighborhoods? You know, we talk so much about the fact that all of these events are in so many different areas throughout uh, the county. So how do we ensure that businesses in the middle, in between, can 
benefit from these events. So with that, um, Mayor Batts is really focusing a lot on small business neighborhood activation. We're talking about how do we use maybe augmented reality, how do we teach people, how do we um, uh, partner with Metro, for instance, to create a, a tour of different neighborhoods and city and um, locations so people can understand. And, and how, do they, how do we connect them to the, the restaurants that are in that location? How do we connect them to the business at our location? So that's really something that we're looking forward to, just really having, building on this opportunity to, to build opportunity for businesses. And what we really have to remember is, yes, there's the direct financial impact, but we also have the indirect financial impact. And if, as a city, if we don't take opportunity, and as partners as well, if we don't take opportunities of these events to build opportunity in financial and you know, economic opportunities, I think we're failing the city. So we really have to build on this. So these are all super important points. And actually, you're building on what Jan started to talk about with respect to infrastructure. Um, this is, you know, when we do the Olympics, this is what we would call a no-build Olympics. It doesn't mean that, that nothing is going to be built. But that wealth of sports teams and sporting activity that we have in LA County means that we have many, if not all, of the venues we need. I know that uh, USC and UCLA will be used for Olympic and media villages. We've got beautiful brand new arenas. Um, SoFi Stadium is probably the jewel of LA right now. Um, but we also have stadiums for LAFC and a stadium that's coming for the Clippers that will also be brand new when the Olympics come and so on. So that infrastructure is here. It's when we talk about the communications infrastructure, the transportation infrastructure, and so on, that those connectors are gonna actually create new business opportunities and hopefully all the work that we're doing to get businesses ready for the new reality will actually pay dividends when the Olympics are over. Right, with that in mind, uh, Luke, why don't you um, help folks understand uh, some of the points that Jan was making with, with respect to uh, communications infrastructure, right? There's gonna be a lot happening, and obviously we wanna stay connected. Absolutely, so um, my name is Luke. I'm the general manager of the Innovation Lab in Los Angeles for Verizon. It's nice to meet you guys. Um, I've been in this role for about four years, and um, every year that I've been here, it's been more and more exciting to kind of see the types of new technologies and new innovations that are being built on top of the Verizon network. Um, in our lab, we do a lot of different work around uh, AR, VR applications, a lot of computer vision, AI, machine learning applications, working with a lot of robotics. We're also doing a lot of content creation uh, with our virtual production stage. So there's a litany of different use cases that we're all really excited about that we think is going to be the, not just the future, but the near present of the way that people interact, play, work, um, and socialize with each other. And what we do in the lab is really kind of a, an incubation space or kind of a look forward into what we hope will be commonplace in, in, in our community, in our, in our city, uh, in the next few years. So, um, you know, I know from starting back in like the 2021 Super Bowl that uh, around 15 to 20 terabytes of data were consumed by Verizon customers uh, for, that, for that specific Super Bowl. Fast forward three years later, I think around 50 to 60 terabytes of, of data was utilized. So that's about a 40 to 50% year over year increase. And I don't really see that you know, decreasing at any point. If you give people the capacity, if you give people the, um, the use case and the applications uh, for them to consume that data, they will find a way to do so. And, uh, and, and entrepreneurs and uh, startups and companies will all find different uh, new applications to build that are gonna take advantage of the network capacity that we're building for them, the low latency, and the edge compute uh, capabilities as well. So we're really excited about the future, and everyone's already mentioned all the different events that are coming up. We see each of those events as temple areas where we can showcase the power and the strength of our network. And more importantly, I think, you know, no one's, no one's gonna go to an event saying, oh, I'm really excited to use the Verizon network. They're gonna say, we wanna, check, we wanna see this uh, cashless checkout store. We wanna understand how to use facial recognition to be able to bypass the ticketing line. We want to understand how to get from one point to another, the wayfinding applications you're mentioning, find the bathrooms faster, find the quickest line to get a, a beer or, or popcorn or food. We don't want to wait in line for 15, 20 minutes. We want to have the best fan experience possible, and all these applications are sitting on top of our network that we hope will power those uh, going to the future. So uh, I got to follow up because some of the stuff that you're talking about involves real-time uh, information on networks that are going to be slammed when we get to the point of like a World Cup event or an Olympics event. So one, how do you manage that? Is some of that built into the arenas themselves or is that really like 
the job of Verizon to build out that capacity so that folks can be agnostic of location and still be able to do those things. And two, what are some of the needs and applications once the person leaves the arena? That is to say, like in the area around the arena or in town when they're doing some of these other things that Jan and Layla were talking about. Yeah, I mean, I think at Verizon, we have some of the best engineers in the world. Like, I'm personally not an engineer. I come from, you know, business background. Um, but I, I know, I interact with engineers all day, every day. Uh, we're actually upgrading our network at the lab as we speak. We're bringing in uh, what we call the private network into our lab. So this is kind of a, a separate network that sits aside from the public network that you and I and everyone in uh, theater have access to. Uh, private networks are really for the back of house venue operations folks that are needing that access, whether you're um, you know, a ticketing person, whether you're selling concessions, whether you're a videographer, photographer, uploading content for the event. So these private networks are really kind of a big focus for us this year as we look towards how do we bring more of our connectivity into the venues. Uh, one big example, so the NFL, uh, we installed private networks into all 32 NFL stadiums this year, and the coach-to-coach -coach, uh, headsets, the communications that are running through them are all powered by our uh, private network as well. So these are the kinds of things that, as we find the use case and sort of land on an, uh, uh, an example of how to utilize it, we then want to further expand upon that and say, great, you've got a, pri you've got a private network installed in your uh, venue, your stadium, your or facility. How do we now bring this, uh, this capacity into other use cases as well? So accelerated access, uh, frictionless checkout, uh, crowd analytics, um, these are all the different uh, examples of ways that we can expand upon how to bring those venue uh, venue operations and, and, and uh, you know, utilizations into the private network ecosystem. Okay, okay. So, Lucho, I want to bring you into this part of the conversation because we've talked a lot about business, enterprise, you know, kind of what's happening big picture. But I do want to talk about the fan experience and about how tech and innovation impacts that. Could you talk a little bit about what you're seeing and what you expect to see in terms of how innovation will impact the experience for fans? Yes, of course. So first I want to say thank you everyone for inviting me and having me on, the, on this panel with this great group. Um, so I'm part of the, the team that is actually helping FIFA build the experience that is going to be supported in 2026. Um, and when, when we see back eight years ago, technology was not there. Like in a sport has been accelerating incredible the last four years. Even the digital connection with 5G is three, four years old. So it's all new. So everyone is experimenting right now how those are gonna be. So uh, how we interconnect the city with the connectivity, with the providers and the sponsors local, plus the sport organizations doing the fan ex and, uh, experience much appealing for them and easy for them to, to deal with, it's gonna be much better. That is everything based on data. Um, so far, there is no way that we can build a fan experience at this point. We did have data that allows us to guide the user properly. So we're talking about transport. Um, how I know I can go to a specific venue and I can take the right roads, or what is the best time to go there? How I can anticipate that? Um, World Cup 2026 is gonna be, I do believe, the first event that is gonna help to capture that data and be much more prepared for 2028. Uh, that is where the, the city needs to be the focus on. And then we need to start kind of working on how that data can also be shared from what we learned from 2026 and how we apply them in 2028. Um, part of what Chef was saying at the beginning was who is the owner of the data? H how we know if I'm Lucho uh, moving from my house to the venue, how my data can be used by the city to improve my uh, transport relationship two years after. Um, and part of that one is part of, the, part of the, 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 the platforms and the ecosystem that we are trying to build with, with, with FIFA itself. Um, it's all about, I think at the beginning we were presenting like having a single app, yes, that is the idea. So everything should be in a centralized place where you can go and inspect what's gonna be happening in the city, where you can go and take a look what is the ticket that you have, when you can actually do some planning, say, okay, I'm gonna go to a restaurant today, I'm gonna enjoy with some uh, friends after in a specific place, um, I have the, uh, the fun party that happened on all the FIFA World Cups, you know, the cities that I know where it is, and I know what time I need to go. All those need to be supported by a specific platforms, but again, it's not a platform that is built by a single sport organization. It actually be composed by city, by provided us Verizon and some others, by us the engineer team that is building, 
um, plus the sport organization all together. And I think, coming back to my point is, when we are able to figure out the concept of how we can share the data for the best of the fans, I think we're gonna be talking about the next generation of sport uh, platforms uh, worldwide. I love it. I, I love this vision of one app to rule them all. Um, the, the question I have for you though is, when we talk about data, and we talk about actually helping fans kind of move through the city, get to their events, and also to be able to do other things, go to restaurants and so on, right? Um, you have a technology platform that will provide an interface for users, but what you're describing seems to need, seems to require more stuff, right? Um, you know, in the olden days, we talked about smart cities and sensors and stuff like that, and of course, there's the issue around authentication and trying to identify who's trying to do what. And then of course there's the enterprise plugin piece, the API piece or whatever, right? Like how do we get the businesses plugged in to this platform so that they can then transact with the users, uh, you know, guide them, engage them, you know, and monetize the activity. Can you talk about that stack yeah, and yeah. how that will come together? Yeah, of course. Um, so first, I want to start saying that when we build platforms, it's our final user is not the only one that is actually looking the platform. It's also the person that is actually creating the content and publishing it through the app. It is the media person which is taking a picture and uploading it into the app to be quickly. It's the restaurant that is in the corner that allows to upload the menu and being able to uh, show to the end users. Or even the one that is building some sort of loyalty programs that they can actually even use in some sort of uh, coins or digital coins as it is today, that can actually be used. So it is not a single platform for end users, it's actually platforms for the person that is the direct to consumer, but also is the, the, the operator that is behind. Um, so all those actually are composing the platform. And the stack is, is, is always the same. We have the back office, which is supporting all of them, is supporting the content publishing, the promotion upload, is supporting everything that is related to experience locally and even experience outside. Is the is the is, is the team the engineering that is taking all that and, and normalizing them in the way that is presented properly? And then is the data points that are captured in the mill. Well, of course, we also need to add the, the mediators as part of the, the, the people that are actually controlling what happening in the middle. But those are part of the entire backbone that is supporting the, the, the platform. Ticketing is the same. For doing the ticketing, maybe like people who is engineer, they know. So the process today is we have a platform which you can upload all the tickets that are happening. There is a smart queue behind the scenes, know how that sales need to be. There is a balance, it's actually it's offer versus demand. How much is the demand? Much higher is gonna be the price of the ticket. All that is engineering, but there is a human interaction be, be behind that one. And that, that is a piece that is supporting part of this technology. Um, and it's actually been able to give the end user all, all that experience. And I wanna add uh, kind of one specific point is, when we think about user, we should not think that it's the same user always. We are actually talking about different segments. The people that is coming from South America, they don't have the same experience that people living here. The people living in Europe is not the same experience living here. Language perspective, maybe some of them, they don't speak English at all. So we need to readapt our D2C experience to allow them to do the same. Right to left, same. Accessibility, same. So all those aspects, again, it's technology and enabler to start talking about them. Before we did it. So before we have a paper, such so a physical ticket, we go to the stadium and that's it. Today transform everything. Today we're not talking about them. We are talking about how we use technology to enable some of those without going into the physical dependency. Uh, and that is the beauty of the transformation that we're seeing right now. Okay, that's great. So hopefully you all got a sense of what each of these folks brings to the table in this conversation. So I'm gonna start asking questions to the whole group. And anybody, you're all welcome to jump in as we go. Um, I wanna start just high level because we've had so much conversation about uh, economic opportunity, economic impact, and we know that there's this parade of incredibly vibrant, global, impactful events that are gonna be coming over the next four years at a minimum and then beyond. We talked about going to uh, 2039 earlier. Um, I wanna talk about how we, as in Los Angeles, prepare to get maximum leverage from all of that. So my first question is just, what are the key milestones or indicators that Los Angeles aims to achieve in a journey towards being
becoming a global leader in the sports and entertainment industries. <laughs> in terms of reaching milestones, um, so as, as we're thinking going forward on uh, reaching 2028 and, and becoming like a sports and entertainment uh, hub, I think there's a lot of things that we are trying to do, at least from the mayor's office. We're, we're thinking of establishing a uh, entertainment task force, for instance. We're doing, we're doing an office just on, um, on entertainment in our office, sports and entertainment. We're doing these events and all to really uh, build, build momentum. So then we're ready when uh, these events come. In addition to that, I think um, you know one thing that we don't talk about is the fact that you know so much money spent on just advertising a city, right? But this is a, like this is the 2026 uh, World Cup. It's this most watched event in the entire world, right? It's five billion people watched that, that game, right? So we're just really taking opportunity from that. So what our, our goal right now in, in working with partners is really how do we enhance the, the visitor experience? How do we enhance like, um, and use this opportunity to build cap uh, capacity and attract more visitors to the city? Because that's really what's gonna really grow our economy. So I think when you talk about milestones, it's for us, it's really creating engagements today so then, uh, and partnerships today so that we can continue to build um, going forward. And because and, we just know that all of, all of our goals are not gonna happen overnight. Um, and actually, adding a good point on what you're saying is, um, between technology, we, we talk about what is pre-arrival workflow. Um, and there is a lot of things that are happening in, in concept around smart cities. How you are not waiting three months before they even start to start engaging with users? How you how you do campaigns that are calling them? How you create virtual environments that they can actually visit the city without depending on being physical in the city? Uh, there is a lot of things that happen on the digital space itself that is actually um, proactively reaching out those fans in a way that they can engage much better. And then again, coming to the point that I was saying before that data allow the city to take decisions, that, that they know where they go, that they know what they are exploring, they know what they are seeing, they have what, what content they consume. If you start kind of normalizing, filtering, and putting that data in a way that can be useful, you can transform the way how you present it to your customers. Um, so th that is a kind of an interesting point, and, and we are doing some of those with the smart cities. The concept of pre-arrival is actually I would say one of the most key aspects on principal aspect of the smart cities today. Yes, on, the, on that piece, I think uh, education training is very important. Actually, the IOC uh, dedicate 30% of the budget to what's called social enterprise. Um, so they're really eager to uh, connect with the city and help the city. Um, you can look at what Paris is doing. Um, I think um, it, it, the most important projects that are in the area of vocational training, sometimes people are just not ready to transition to another career. It's risky, they don't see what's in it for them. But if you look at the games and you look at what's needed for the games and all the transformation infrastructure, service monitoring model shift in terms of behavior and how you want to encourage people to travel or to uh, um, relate to the city differently, um, you need urban furniture, for example. You need landscaping. Um, if you design a bike lane, you design a, a walkable path, and you want it to make more important, you, you can look at, for example, you've been to Paris, um, uh, Rivoli, uh, Concorde, and the Champs Elysees. Um, it, it wasn't always this way. Uh, pedestrians have more space than cars. Cars are just one lane. Pedestrian is almost like a freeway. You can walk on the 405. That way it looks if you take the equivalent uh, uh, with Los Angeles. So, to get there, it, it didn't happen overnight. You look at all the projects also with bikes, uh, bike lanes and so on. So what I'm saying is that there's a lot of training that's supported. We have Accor Hotel, which is uh, would be the equivalent of Hilton, you know, Accor. So they, they have a strong uh, partnership with the Olympics and they're training people. Exactly what you were saying, you know, uh, I can relate. Like when you're traveling um, um, and you, 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 speak, you don't speak the language, there's people that are gonna land in Los Angeles, they don't speak English, they don't speak Spanish. They only speak Japanese. How do they navigate whatever you're thinking of is amazing, but wh what is their experience? So once again, this is what's complicated in sport is that um, they're all excited about the show, but they're coming from different countries and so on. So that's the first thing. Um, you also want to, landscaping is another, another avenue. Um, it's, it's, I was talking about it with uh, somebody at CSUDH and about 
confidence. Sometimes when you look with specific demographics and students and specific people that live in LA, they just look at an industry entertainment and they think, okay, I was born here, is this for me? You know, and that's very powerful and very, you know, you can relate. Um, and uh, our campus is in uh, Carson where we, we have a, you know, there's a unique situation. We're gonna have the sports, the South Bay Sports Park, which we're gonna be an Olympic site. And we're gonna be dealing with all this potential for the people that live around our thing. And the same for all the, the other, there are four big Olympic parks, and Sepulveda, uh, downtown LA, uh, South Bay, and uh, Long Beach. Um, and, and so it's like using the games to inspire people. Um, and there's a lot of things that are not, like we talk a lot about economic impact. I'm sorry, but sometimes there are things that are positive that you can't measure. Happiness, you can't measure happiness. You can't measure motivation at work, okay? Um, so those things, are, I think, um, a good thing to motivate, show the good example. You're gonna have athletes, girls, Paralympics, people that train for years, they don't have a leg. L look at what